Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So let's just, let's just take a moment to look at just that one sentence in regards to faith. Because my, what I'm going to make a case for this morning is that it is not the quantity of your faith, it's not the quantity of your belief that matters, but the quality of your faith, meaning that your faith has to be in something objective. It's not how good you feel about Jesus. It's not about how many days kind of get added up when you die and you're on your deathbed and you go, well, I had 16,197 good faithful days and I only had 297 bad faithful days. It's not that. It is that you and I have placed our faith in an objective reality and that is Jesus Christ. It is the object of your faith that matters more than how you feel about it. The faith is not found in the quantity of your belief, but in the quality of your belief. So let's talk about this word faith just for a moment. For those that maybe this is your first Sunday, you hadn't been in church in a while, and you're going, okay, I've heard about faith. If, if we could just kind of dissect down the parts of this word faith, what does it mean? And I would contend that faith is to recognize something and agree with it. Let me say that again. Faith is recognizing something and agreeing with it. Now let's, let's talk about how most of us recognize something, but maybe not agree with it. There's folks that you've done life with, maybe in your family, you go to work with them, and they have no problem recognizing Jesus Christ. They would, they would say something like, yeah, yeah, real guy, real character in the past, really lived in Israel, lived in Jerusalem, yep, miracle worker, rabbi, faith teacher, etc. So they recognize that a real person in real time named Jesus really lived. But if you ask them, do you agree and believe in their teaching, and they say, no, that is not saving faith. I can look at this chair in front of me. and I, We've used chair, chairs for faith as long as I've known. And, and so there's a, there's a chair, and I recognize that it's a chair, that it's meant for people sitting in it. But I express faith in that chair when I sit down and I agree with its ability. I recognize and I agree that it was made for me to sit on it and hold my weight. In Christ, faith is recognizing who he is according to his word and agreeing with what he says. It is not just acknowledgement. It's not just that you know he was a real figure in history, but it's that you would align yourself and agree with what he says. This is the basics of faith. Now, let's talk about this word assurance. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And this is a really interesting word, this word assurance. It's this Greek word hypostasis, and it's actually found also in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. So what does this word mean? You could take it to mean the word understand, but it might actually be more appropriate to say assurance means to stand under. So think of it like this, recognize and agree. Assurance is to understand and to stand under it. It is as if it's talking about a legal set of documents that are binding. That when you and I have assurance, what we're saying is, I stand under and I know that what I'm standing under, I understand and I stand under it. And I agree and have assurance and have confidence of what it is that I believe in. It's also used in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 regarding when it talks about Christ being the exact imprint 
of God. It is like a guarantee, it's confidence, assurance that Christ is who he says he is, that he is in the Trinity. He's the exact representation of the Father. And so when you and I place our faith in Christ, we're placing our faith in who he says he is, that he is God. I stand under him. And it's this thing hoped for. Again, it's not a fleeting hope. It's not a wishful hope. It's not when you sit down and watch a football game and I hope it turns out like this. Or you watch the news and you go, I hope this happens. Or when the election comes around, I hope this person becomes elected. It's not that because you don't know the end result of that. We have hope in Christ because he not only came, but he's coming back because of his death, burial, and resurrection. You and I have a hope. Now, let's keep moving a little bit. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It is the conviction of things unseen. This word for conviction is the only time in the New Testament that it's used here. And it's pronounced elenkos. And it means literally definitive proof. So if, if you are like in a court case and you have different objects of evidence against so-and-so because they did such and such, all right? And you're like, we found a knife in the... And they're like, well, did it have his blood on it? Was it really part of it? It's not definitive proof. It's just a piece of evidence. So even though you might have six or seven things in the court case, those are not definitive proof. If they were to take something and go... His fingerprints are on it. His spit and saliva is on it. it. We have a picture of the guy using it. That's definitive proof. In the same manner here, this conviction is that you have definitive proof in the Lord. And how you and I believe in this definitive proof is by the eyewitnesses of Christ's crucifixion and his resurrection, that you and I have faithful testimony that's been passed down for years and years, that definitive proof that Christ died for your sin. And the things unseen are the things that you haven't seen in regards to your salvation. So I have to have a conviction in what Christ says, stand under and understand that when Christ said who he said he was, that he did what he said he was going to do, even though I don't see him, my faith is an objective reality of recognizing and agreeing who Christ said he is. Because I didn't see salvation take place necessarily at the cross. I didn't see necessarily what takes place in the heavenlies in regards to his resurrection. So I believe with conviction. Because of his proof. Now, that is going to play dramatically into the rest of Hebrews chapter 11 because we're going to see a list of people that lived by faith. All right? And these folks all have some things in common. They all had, well, except for Enoch, all of them had moral failures, all of them had disturbances. All of them had situations in which they failed, and yet these people are considered in the hall of faith because they had an objective faith in God. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to bounce around quite a bit, okay? We're not going to go through each one of them, but the first one we're going to talk about is Abraham. I want you to go to verse 8. And we're going to go through the verse 10. And then we're going to later jump to 17 through 19. Let's go to Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Okay, so you have Abraham. We're, we're talking about characters that lived by faith. You and I, and I have a friend that keeps making fun of me that I talk about putting on my Jewish hat. But you're going to have to put your Jewish hat and go back 4,200 years ago to a time of life that you and I have no idea 
how they live. Okay? Now here, here's why I'm getting to this. 4,200 years ago, in the time of Abraham, the way they lived, they were nomads, and they lived by the family. Through the family, in the family, by the family. So my family is little. I got very little people in it. All right? I got my wife. I got my four kids. I got my mom. I might have an aunt and uncle and a couple cousins. That's about it. I got a little family. And we don't live anywhere close to each other. Why? Because we are in a culture that that's normal. I go to high school or go to college. I leave the house. I go get a job, get married. These are normative practices in our day and time. Some people move across the country. You go move at least across the city, something like that. Not 4,200 years ago. 4,200 years ago, you worked with the family. If dad was a shepherd, you're probably a shepherd. Okay? You're not an engineer and he's a musician. Like It's just a reality. You work with the family. It's not five people living in the family. It's more like 55 people living in a family. And you know everything by the family. You live through the family. You're in the family. You have the livestock with the family. And you believe like the family. So this is total Jewish lore. You won't find this in the the Old Testament, New Testament at all. Okay. A lot of Jewish lore says that Abraham's dad was an idol maker. Okay, so whether that's true or not, I don't know. But just for the sake of argument, let's talk about it. So Abraham not only is with the family, he's in the family. He makes his income by the family. They live and build on the houses in apartment-looking style with the family. They're growing this massive empire. And then dad, Terah, also has lots of household idols that he makes. And he sells them. That's one of the things he makes money with. So Abraham comes from a background of idol makers. And so make a little copper one, a little brass one, a little wooden one, a little stone one. And their belief was, I make this thing, and though I know this isn't necessarily God, I observe it in my house believing that I can possess a part of this so-called God and that I got this God for certain things in my life, and then I got this one for certain things in my life. And so I've got a whole plethora of, I got one for rain, I got one for child making, I got one for food, and I, and I live by a polytheistic style of gods. That is the background of Abraham. Now imagine for a moment you get to Genesis chapter 12. And this man named Abram hears God. They have only seen They've only seen, as they've made them, these little false gods, these little subterraneous gods, so to speak. And Abram hears God. And this is what God tells him. You're going to leave. You're going to to be a blessing to other nations. You're going to have a family. I'm going to give you land. And Abram takes that weighty information... And now has a decision to make for the rest of his life. Because again, you think about this in today's context. Okay, leave your house. Go get a job. Go get a wife. Go get kids. You're going to have some land. It'd be nothing for me to tell mom, hey mom, I graduated from high school, from college. I'm going on from here. And they're like, all right, great. Hope it's well. Do you have enough money to get an apartment? You know, it's just no big deal. Abraham. Hey dad. Um... God spoke to me, I'm leaving the family, and I'm not going to do work like you guys are doing. That's a whole different conversation. That is a life and death conversation. Because for us, it's like, well, you leave the house, did your car break down, call dad, we come down, we kind of fix it, I just take the transit, go over there. Well, you're not taking a transit in Judea. You're not getting on the train or the car or whatever. You are leaving and trusting God. And by faith, Abraham left. But here's what's interesting. Are you ready? 
this isn't even what Moses considers the faith that God counted as righteous. These are living by faith, by no means. I mean, absolutely. But even this is not what Moses calls living by faith and having been counted as righteous. Go to Genesis chapter 15 for a moment and go to verse 2. Genesis 15, go to verse 2. But Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you've given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. So Abraham's remind, he's mindful, he's remembering that the Lord told him, you're going to have a family, you're going to have a nation. He's going, I don't have a kiddo, but it's okay. We've kind of got one. It's through Eliezer. It's, we've kind of got it worked out. <laughs> God's like, no. Verse 4, behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. Watch this, verse 5. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Why is this so absolutely important regarding the faith that Abraham had? It's because essentially Abraham could only believe God to bring about a son because Abraham can't do anything to bring it about. I, I'm aside, I'm trying to be goofy. Aside from intimacy, there's nothing that Abraham can do to make this thing happen. You take Sarah, who's barren, and a 90 plus year old Abraham, that's not a good measure of success to have kids. That's not a good formula. This has to be something that only God can do. And therefore, Abraham believes God, and this is counted to him as righteousness. This continues this piece that it's not about the quantity of your faith, but it's in the quality of faith that you would have objective faith in the one called God. And that we see through Jesus Christ. Abraham believed God. To the extent that you and I get to uh, Hebrews 11, verse 17, Abraham's tested. It says this, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered, watch this, this is unbelievable, that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, He did receive him back. Abraham was literally willing to the knife in the air to do what God said because he believed God's promises. Promises that Abraham couldn't do to make happen. It was all upon the Lord to accomplish these things. And this is why his faith was credited as righteousness. This objective faith of recognizing and agreeing that I stand under God and what he has said. 